an event like the Birdsville races, uh, not long ago it would have actually been my very, very worst nightmare. It would have been a war zone for me. Is this just going to be a massive weekend? There's probably about 8,000 people here having a terrific party, having a great old time. And not long ago I would have been one of those people. I probably would have been a contender for the drunkest on ground. That was always my little claim to fame as a young country party girl. The journey from the old Shanna to who I am now, God, it's been a long road. How many times have you heard that today? But it's the most rewarding, extraordinary thing I've ever done with my life, and I would change nothing about it. Nothing. Unfortunately, Shanna's story probably isn't unique. There are a lot of people that struggle with alcohol addiction in regional, rural and remote areas where there's not a lot of services and not a lot of support. Uh, what's unique about Shanna, though, is that she is so very, very open about her personal struggles. Five years ago, I was a total raging, undiagnosed, untreated alcoholic. And I had been slipping through the cracks of our healthcare system most of my life. People ask me all the time, what is sober in the country? Is it, a, is it a service? Is it a thing? And my response is, actually, it's a conversation and it's a movement. We're encouraging Australians to have a yarn about our, how we drink, particularly in the bush. We identify a bloke by how many beers he can drink. You know, we measure a man for how much grog he can put away without falling over. We do it with girls as well. She's come a long way. It's a stark contrast from a, a drunken, blibbering mess, not being able to put two words together, to stand with a microphone in front of hundreds of people. I don't demonise drinking. I don't. It's not my thing. It's an impressive journey. Australia doesn't even have a national alcohol strategy. And the reason is, is because it's uncomfortable. Because we all love a drink. Thank you so much. <laughs> Something I get asked again and again from people is, so Shanna, how, how did a girl with all of the love and family support and positive upbringing and potential and opportunity go off track so much? How'd that happen? So I grew up in northwestern New South Wales. Home for me was um, on a property, um, about an hour and a half from Moree. I was just very, very happy, free-range country kid, just belting around the paddocks, bareback on my horse. When I was 11, I went off to boarding school in Toowoomba. It was a real shock to my system. I didn't cope well at all. I was terribly homesick. She just didn't fit. She just didn't have a sense of confidence. She was a shy kid. Boarding school had a lot of constraints, formal things that we had to abide by, and that was very difficult for Shan. By the time boarding school finished, I was really feeling caged in and rebellious, and I jacked up and said, no way, I am not going from one institution to another. I'm taking a year off. Took a time. So I spent the next few years after that um, basically just moving around Australia quite a lot, working on stations, working with horses, working with stock. So I was extremely naive, I was extremely young, and I was a pretty little thing. Um, off, off to adventure. Hello, my darling. So then some unfortunate rotten things happened to me as a young girl. This is really quite a difficult conversation for me to have. This is not something I talk about as a rule, but within the space of one year, I, I lost my virginity to date rape, um, to somebody that I trusted and cared about, um, and then someone else in a position of authority on a remote property that I also trusted and sort of looked up to, then um, also behaved extremely inappropriately on a number of occasions. Um, and within the space of one year, uh, I'd been sexually assaulted 
four separate times. And so I kind of didn't speak up and didn't say anything about it because I felt that age-old classic, I must have done something to deserve that. And you've got to remember, there was no internet, no mobile phones, nothing like that. I didn't even have a vehicle. So I'm kind of in the middle of the no in the middle of nowhere, isolated. She had a quietness about her. I didn't know what was going on, but I had a sense that there was something big had happened into her life. The truth is those things completely, completely altered the trajectory of my life. I had been discarded like a piece of trash and treated like a piece of trash. And the impact of that on my psychology and self-worth was just extraordinary. And, and I hid behind alcohol. The alcohol kind of masked the pain or it gave me courage in a social situation. And I developed this alter ego of a really wild party girl. But in, uh, in underneath all that, I was bloody shit scared of everything. Initially, it was very funny. She was pretty cool. She was the central larrikin. And then he'd um, progressed to not being so. He'd progressed to being an absolute mess, an absolute nightmare for Shan and, and for those around her that loved her so much. I was never someone who could go and behave myself. I was one of those people where one was too many and a thousand was not enough. I went on to work in agriculture. All through my 20s and 30s, no matter what I was doing, the common thread throughout every single country town that I lived in, or every remote area, was that we all came together over alcohol. It's how you met people, and it's how you fitted in, and it's how you did work, and it's how you did deals. Not once did it occur to me that I might be an alcoholic. I thought alcoholics had to be a homeless person who drank all day and drank every day, or drank during the day, and I was none of that. So Tim came into my life in my early 30s, and it was an extremely dysfunctional, rocky beginning, let me tell you, because he, he saw very quickly that I was not okay. Righto, Timbo, which way is our beautiful veranda? Is this our veranda door? Oh, yes. I reckon just close towards the fire there a bit. She was the one that was still up at the end of the night and, and drinking on, you know, and partying on when, you know, most people had had enough. I guess I didn't know if she was an alcoholic as such, but I knew there was a big issue there, at the very least. Um, you know, it wasn't normal. And I was going, come back here. You're a great guy. You should marry me. And he's like, I don't think so. <laughs> Do you remember? Yeah, no, I remember. <laughs> the easy thing to do would have been to walk away. And that's sort of what I wanted to do at times. But, but I knew that uh, there was someone inside Chan that was worth fighting for. She admired Tim. He was a good old, solid country bloke. He was quiet and easy going. We got fresh water from him. And he really did help her. It helped her in giving her a solid foundation for a while. I'm going to see if Daddy can throw you higher than the windmill. Go, Dallas! Oh! <laughs> oh! God, he's beautiful. During that time, I developed an absolute madly passionate, obsessive love for photography and the outback. Oh, Dallas, you are a little bit ridiculously cute. And it just went so well that I was able to be more or less self-employed full time as a family photographer. It was wonderful, a rural family photographer. I'm strong, you know that, right? <laughs> and I was suddenly away from home a lot. There was a definite increase in my drinking. OK, I've got another idea. You ready? Retrospectively, what I can now say is that I had become a high-functioning alcoholic who was extraordinary by day and literally falling apart in increments by night. Her binge drinking was escalating. Just one glass, two glasses, then they turned into bottles. One, two, three, four bottles of wine. I then started to feel quite embarrassed about um, buying two bottles of wine every night 
you know. So I started rotating uh, bottle shops in my local towns, thinking, oh, I don't want these people to think I'm an alcoholic, because I'm not. <laughs> Thanks, darling. Have a good weekend. See ya. Bye. It wasn't a pretty sight. When, when I'd come home, if she'd drunk, you know, two, two bottles of wine, she'd be uh, often lying on the floor. You know, whatever alcohol was left, I'd tip down the sink and, and you know, we were just doing that. That was happening consistently, you know, you know, week after week after week for a, a number of years. So that um, obviously took its toll. I knew that Shan needed help, but I had really no idea how, how to help her. I tried absolutely everything that I could think of. I asked myself the question every day, why, why the hell would you want to drink like this every day and do this to yourself? And then the final straw for Shan was the news that her and Timbo weren't able to become parents and Shan a mum. Her whole dream was to become a mum. And that was a really convenient excuse in a way too for her to drink more. On my side of things, I'm over here going, well, you know, you, here you are drinking more and we're trying to, we're trying to get pregnant and um, you're making that problem worse for yourself. And that was extremely frustrating for me too. And in the very lowest of the low of the low moments, I would say to him, you know what? I, I actually think you should leave. I actually think you should leave me. I think you should bugger off and go find yourself a nice, healthy, lovely, normal woman to be married to because what the hell have I got here for you? You know, like I can't, I can't pull myself out of this. When Tim and I first hooked up, right, this is what he expected. When I make a commitment, it's forever. Like it's not, I, I didn't take that lightly at all. So I guess I, I made the call that, that I, had to, I had to take it upon my own shoulders to fix the problem. My rock bottom was Boxing Day in 2014. Everything's very much about children, as it should be at Christmas. But when you are minus children, the pain of it is extremely, extremely acute at that time of year. I remember I was white knuckling, which is what they call it when you want to drink, but you don't. And I just got up proud. I walked straight past everyone. I was like a zombie. And I got in my car and went to the bottle shop and I went, make it three bottles, thanks. <laughs> and I think in that moment, I was kind of hoping maybe I could take my own life. I'd thought about it so many times. Yeah, walked in, the, in our house to, to find Shen on the floor with a big cut, passed out, big cut above her eye. She was at the bottom of a flight of, flight of stairs at home. I had to rush her to hospital and, and yeah, that was, that was pretty tough going. I woke up and there was Tim looking at me. At that point, I was certainly almost ready to give up, I'd, I would say. Seeing that he had reached his limit, that finally, I don't know, just got through to that part of my brain where I went, OK, this is going to end. I am going to die, like, soon, very, very soon, and I have to do something and I have to do it now. That afternoon, I picked up a phone and I rang a national a number for AA. And I arranged to drive to Tamworth to meet this lady. Her name was Ali. Ali. <laughs> yeah. Hi. Hello, beautiful. <laughs> Shan was nervous that day. She was nervous. She was raw. Oh, my goodness, Ali, come sit. Come I could hear this just sheer desperation. Like, it was... Life or death for Shan. And that was a hugely pivotal moment. She needed a way out. And I told her there was a way out. There was a way out of this dark hole. I'd been there. I'd been there. Um, I, was, I was a drunk through and through, though. I was, I was a, a full-on alcoholic. I struggled with alcoholism from the age of 13 to 34 before I overcame it. It was just a game changer for Shen to see that this person was someone similar to her. Well dressed, good looking girl, a similar age. Our stories are just so similar. Exactly. So similar. But also a huge realisation that, that an alcoholic didn't have to be 
that guy in the in the gutter with the brown paper bag. Once upon a time, a conversation saved my life. That's why. I said, well, this is what we do. There's a program. There are steps. There's action. There are things you have to do. There are things you can't do. This doesn't just happen overnight. I just stood and I looked it in the eye and I said, this is what it is. And no more, no more. I, I need to fight now. Yes, I did the work. Yes, I worked my guts out, but there was divine intervention. That was the end of it. It just, um, yeah, it just stopped and she hasn't had a drink since. With me, I had an almost overnight miracle transition from crazy Shanna to no more. And that's not a common story. And I will tell anybody any day of the week, what happened with we, me was very much a miracle. Here is to sober life yes. and sober friends, yes. which are pretty much now all my friends. Yeah. When I was very, very first in my recovery from alcoholism, I thought, OK, everyone tells me I should help others to help myself. So I thought, I'll start one of these anonymous meetings. 90% of the time, I was by myself, opening and closing a building and going home brokenhearted. So I learned the hard way that people will not come publicly into a building in a small town because the risk of them being seen for them is too great. You can't be anonymous in a small country town because everybody knows each other. Remember the old Ute? Yeah, <laughs> After a, a, a complete year of sobriety, I recall a little inkling of an idea forming in the back of my mind that one day I would do something very significant with the miracle that I had been given. Remember that? Yeah. Remember when we were, like, young? Oh, yeah. <laughs> and we were watching an Australian story and where someone was speaking publicly about recovery from alcoholism. Well, Mark, there have been a number of promises in the past about the... And the chief of staff sat me down and she said, you're not OK, are you? And um, I just said no. And then I had an epiphany and I turned around and I said, nobody does this in the country, like, no one speaks about alcohol abuse or addiction or alcoholism, God forbid, in a bush setting. Can I be that person? What I realised is that we have this kind of a casual alcoholism culture in the outback of Australia where we may go weeks on end without seeing anyone. So when we do, it's quite often going to be a party and enter alcohol. I think the drought makes a lot of things hard to handle. It's something that we're hearing anecdotally that, that people's consumption of alcohol is going up in the drought and people are using that as a coping mechanism. If you look at the statistics around vehicular fatalities in country Australia, alcohol is present in a much higher percentage of them than it is in the city. Alcohol is associated with isolation, loneliness, despair, stress, drought, mental health, you name it. So that portion of the discussion is kept undercover and private. <laughs> so as, as tricky as it might have been, I, I made a very conscious decision that I would basically take my own very painful and private story and open it for public dissection and throw myself under the bus as a way of helping others to feel less frightened to step up and ask for help and acknowledge that they weren't OK either. So really, it all just began as one girl in the middle of the outback with a laptop. So I just started sharing snippets of my own story. Really raw, really authentic, no fluff. Just, this is how it's been, this is how it was. Maybe this will resonate with someone out there. Thinking about the seriousness of that isolation for someone who's battling addiction or, or any illness for that. I called it Sober in the Country. A bit of a spin-off on Sex in the City. It was a bit of a daggy um, dig at that program. And the recurring theme I kept getting was, how you speak makes sense to me. Nothing's ever actually made sense to me before in this space. Can you keep telling us more? I was a bit nervous. I put a call out saying, guys, 
I'd like to start blogging and sharing your stories because I know there's not just me. And so suddenly support started coming in this little trickle. And then the next thing they would often say is, I'd n I never comment because I'm far too scared to comment on your page because what would people think? It took me six months until the light bulb went off and I thought, you silly bugger, what you need to do is create a private offshoot of this page so that people can speak without fear of judgment. So the rules on entry are this is strictly confidential. I treat that group as my family and I protect them fiercely. Within six months, I had 200 people. There were so many people, so many people in this fight and we're like, yeah, welcome, welcome to the madhouse, come on in. And suddenly these people who have just felt so alone and so isolated are finding their family. There's definitely a lack of help for people in the country if they have alcohol problems. I drank, I binged, I was the crazy party girl. I there are services out there, but there needs to be more services that are well tailored to people in a rural context. So what works in cities in terms of providing uh, alcohol counselling, for instance, uh, doesn't necessarily work in rural areas. I didn't want to live anymore, I was done. We're just generally supportive of the work that she's doing. We really think it's important. And we're country people, and we're tough, and we're stoic, so we don't ask for help. I'm just speaking the truth, and I'm opening and breaking wide open a topic that has historically been so very, very taboo. I was actually driving home from a job. I'm managing corporate farms, and uh, I was listening to the radio, and I heard Shanna do a brief interview and it touched a nerve with me. Just not because my story is everywhere and that is the reason it resonates so far and so wide. I wrote down a name and uh, when I got home that afternoon, I, I made contact with her. It was a huge turning point in my life. I realised that I was an alcoholic. It was a very humbling experience uh, to realise that uh, something else had control of your life. And... Um, was taking you to probably to places that uh, you wouldn't normally go. And I had a look at uh, the Sober in the Country uh, Facebook site. It was a relief. It was joining in to a community that could be of help. There were similar stories. And then after a while, I actually told my whole story to that group. Uh, some pretty dark days there for me. I think I got the first reaction to what I'd written within three minutes. And I actually found in telling the story that it made me feel a whole lot better. For me personally, my choice will to be never to drink again. It's given me strength. Um, I have a little saying that uh, for me today, the mountains aren't quite so high and the valleys aren't so deep. Hey Nico, keep your eye out because I think there might be a wallaby up ahead. I turned four, as they call it, in sobriety last February. I took a group of friends up Mount Capita, which is our beautiful local mountain range, and we had a weekend in a cabin drinking hot cocoa. Down to the left. Which way, tour guide Tim? Tim did an impromptu speech. He just spoke about the fact that we'd made it and how, how amazing it was to have his wife back. And yeah, it was just really, it was really emotional. I would open my mouth and burst into tears, which, you know, doesn't happen very often, but um, yeah, it was, it was quite emotional to, to reach that, that, um, that milestone. And, and, you know, it's fantastic that she's done it. Thanks for being my husband. My pleasure. <laughs> Sweet night. You're the best husband I've ever had. Did you know that? <laughs> You're the best wife. Life that I've ever had. Am I? Racing and 61 Tigers away fairly. My vision for the future is a really, really simple one. Because we need the old girls and the young girls to do it. I would love nothing more than to see a rural Australia in which a man or a woman is free to say no thank you to a, to a drink and for it to be left at that. It's not easy actually not drinking because 
if you don't drink, I guess you get ostracised for, for not participating. So something I'm always at great pains to point out with Sober in the Country is that we do not demonise drinking, we do not give a hard time to our mates who are enjoying a beer. It's literally the antithesis of what this conversation is about. All we're doing is just making it socially acceptable when our mates might say no thanks or not today to grog. I was grabbed by uh, uh, Great Northern. Have you got any soda water there? So in 2019, life for us looks like life for anyone else. We just do what we do. Tim has a beer, I don't. It's that simple. Today there's beer in the fridge. Doesn't worry me. Hey, sweetie. Thank they didn't you. have any soda water. Surprise, surprise. Thank you, my darling. No worries. It's definitely had a big impact on our social life because she doesn't drink. It's hard to fit in, I suppose, when you're, when you're a non-drinker. That's definitely uh, made it a little bit harder, but, you know, wouldn't have it any other way, though. Here we go. But you guys actually do look amazing. I think that what Shan's been doing over these last few years is just amazing. I think it's courageous and brave. So, how many days off do you have to recover? I don't know how she's done it, to tell you the truth, with no support uh, except of, uh, of her husband, Tim, and the time that she puts in. Uh, to do that by herself, I am simply astounded. If the worst part of my life and many lost years can be converted into a powerful story of hope for other people, then no, I regret nothing. I am so bloody grateful for every single thing that I have. I'm so grateful for what sobriety has brought into my life, what it's done for my health, my focus. And if I can give that little bit of hope to someone else, well, I will do that forever. Out here in the Australian bush, this is a great tree to come across, and the reason it's good, uh, underneath the bark here, if you just peel away some of this bark, there's a really good source of protein under here. Normally you'll find... Uh, wait a second. There we go, there it is. There you go, folks. So um, if you work hard, you can often uh, find something like this, and um, it'll get you through the rest of the day. So just a little tip for you. There you go. Tim, you promised me you wouldn't bring Dorsey Dad out. <laughs> I can't speak to you ever again. Yeah. <laughs>